I'm very honored to be here for this day, for Jennifer and for everybody and for my own edification. So what was the difference between dancing with Pearl Lang and dancing with Jose Limon? She taught me how to get across the floor in three steps. There was just no question. That was just... And she taught me how to be professional because I never have missed one day of work in my life. And then when I got to dance with Jose, when I first studied Limon technique, strangely enough, in Connecticut College, and you had to bend and do things like that because Pearl Lang was gram-based, right? I was like, this feels very, very strange. You know, I don't understand this at all. But slowly that became something I felt better doing. It was, I felt better suited on my body at that. And I felt that there was a kind of humanism in the company that attracted me uh, and, and passion. And uh, gradually, as I got to do parts in the company, it was very interesting because I did Desdemona to Jose's uh, Othello. And, and you were, I was scared. I mean, I thought he would really choke me to death every night, you know, because he really was in his character. I know what I got from Manasakalo because I got that inevitability. And when I teach actually choreography and I talk about a surprise versus inevitability, and people say, what is inevitability? Well, inevitability is like what you absolutely have to do next. You know, and you would be, you'd be in a position like, like this, and she'd say, okay, what do you need to do next? And you'd go, and she'd go, I don't believe you! And so you'd, there you were again. <laughs> and you'd go, I don't believe you! And, then you, would go, and you, you could be there for 40 minutes. <laughs> And until you figured out what she thought you had to do next, right? So then you started working with Louis Falco, who, um, uh, who I don't think of as a choreographer who is stuck in a place waiting for the inevitable. Um, so what was that like? And was that, was that liberating in some way that you started to be in Louis Falco's works? Well, you've you got to remember, Lewis and I danced together from 64 as partners on. In, in his memorial, I said he was like the sun. People just like, became magnets to his, his sun. And I was in, let's say, the moon then. You know? I was the, the organizer. I was the intellectual. I was the peacemaker. I was the, and he was the impulsive one. And that's the way he choreographed. So he would impulsively start a piece. And I once asked him, because I'm... You know, I need to know what things are. So I said, Lewis, what's it about? And he said, well, lots of things. <laughs> I said, well, that's not enough for me to work with, you know? <laughs> so I would start to make my own logic, you know, in terms of what his pieces were about. But we, we really felt in those days, we were, we were break, breaking a lot of rules that were still around the dance world and, and felt very strongly about what we were doing. I felt... Um, in pieces that I had started, like nostalgia and things like that. Uh, and then eventually when we got to sleepers and pieces like that. But it was about not historic characters, not Clytemnestra, not Morse Pavan, not Bach, not, you know, this, it was about not some figure larger than life. It was about us living now today. What I find somewhat ironic is, um, you know, Louis Falco and, and this kind of statement he has on his website, uh, he died in what year? Um, he died a while ago. Um, anyway, there is a website, Louis Falco website, and he talks about not wanting to be the Jesus Christ figure or the Othello figure. But my memory in the, 70, in the 60s at Connecticut College was that Louis Falco and Jennifer Muller were the god and goddess. <laughs> <laughs> so, they, you know, that's how we thought of you, and even on stage. So, you know, here you guys were trying to do anti-hero or thinking of yourselves as anti-hero, but our vision was, oh my God, these people are amazingly beautiful. Um, and I think what happened was with that, with those ideas that you just said, there, there, there did come a glamour with it because of who the two of you were and what you looked like. Um, so, were you aware of that kind of glamour? Uh, Lewis was very very much more involved with glamour than I ever was, but he expected his women to always wear makeup, to look attractive at all times. He was very, very strong about that. I mean, he, that was um, important to him. He had so much more under that that I think people never saw and never really looked at. I read a Dance Magazine article on you. That was a, uh, there was a feature in 78 and another one in 83, and um, you talked about when Sleepers was first shown, and how Jose Limon was quite upset uh, at seeing it. So I wish you'd talk more about that. Why was he upset? What was, how, um, 
how did he treat you after that, and how did you feel about all that? Well, it, right around the 68 time, when we went to Spoleto for the first time, Lewis and I, and um, we brought along some gram dancers and a pickup company, kind of. It was the year before the first Falco company was together. And uh, we came back, and Jose wasn't really rehearsing or dancing very much at that time. And so we got, the we, next couple of years, nothing really happened except we were doing our work. And we got a message from the office, from Pauline or somebody like that, said, you, you better watch out, you know, you better come back and, and show that you're really, have affection for Jose and want to be around him and everything. So we came up with what we thought was a brilliant idea. Just as Doris Humphrey kind of was a patron of Jose, that we would make Jose the patron of our new work. And we were like really excited about doing this. And so we invited him to the studio to see Sleepers. And he sat down and uh, we did Sleepers and there was complete silence. He started to put his shoes on. And he got up and he started screaming at me. I think he was screaming at me because he couldn't really scream at Lewis or couldn't get the courage to scream at Lewis, who knows what. And stormed out, stormed out. And I called Martha Hill, because I was teaching at Juilliard at that time, and I said, something terrible has happened. We've had this terrible uh, thing that just went down, and uh, I'm very upset. Can you help me with this and, and try to smooth it over and figure something out? And the next day, I was fired from Juilliard. So that's my story. What do you look for in a dancer? I look for a vivid personality. I don't, I don't look for people who hide. You know, I look for someone who is there inside, and I look for someone who's willing to work hard and has no arrogance. What's the um, destructiveness of arrogance in the, in the studio? I think, I think what bothers me about arrogance, what, what I re resist about arrogance, is that you believe you're better than the next person. You believe that you're not, and I believe in the validity of all individuals really, really, really deeply. I've already heard from some of the student dancers that they had a great time learning speeds, um, which I haven't seen and look forward to seeing tonight. Um, but that is a piece that was made on professional dancers, and here you are teaching student dancers. What are some of the challenges of, um, from your side of teaching speeds to student dancers, and what do you think the challenges are for them? Well, it's very, very odd. Christopher and I have had a couple of interesting discussions, because whenever I go in, even to a school like this, I don't... I don't think of them as students. I think of this is a group of dancers that I have to teach speeds. And it would be like somebody new coming into my company or um, putting on another professional company where there's some, you know, different technique or problems with the technique or something. It's like, how do I get this individual person from here to here? How do I get the piece from here to here? Well, um, thank you. I've, I think we've all really enjoyed this this little insight into your process and who you are.